All right. We're a little after 10, and I'm one of these punctual guys. And so we'll uh, start here in just a minute. We want to welcome all of you to South Dayton Presbyterian Church for our fall conference featuring Dr. Paul Gould. I don't need to go into all the details of who he is because you know who he is, but we're just delighted that he's here. And uh, we just look forward to the day. I just want to quickly, how this day will look, uh, we'll do this session, there'll be a short break, and then we'll do session two, which will start around 11. It'll lead to lunchtime. There is a catered box lunch, Chick-fil-A, coming, and there will be, they will be out there, and there's going to be a variety of box lunches. We've got the table set up, and by then it'll be dry on the deck, too. So uh, you can eat out there, and then we'll reconvene around 1 o'clock for the final session with Dr. Gould. He reminded me, too, he'll be doing Q&A uh, during these sessions. And uh, we are just, again, delighted to have you here. Uh, you'll hear more about uh, um, him as, I, as we go. But right now, I want to ask one of our elders, Sharon Pavarni, to come on up and uh, pray. And then we'll get going. OK, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we are so grateful to you for your word. We thank you that in your amazing power, you have preserved this, the, this amazing book through all these years. Now, as Dr. Gould opens up the Bible to us, we ask that he would grant him spirit of uh, openness, boldness, to proclaim the truth of God. And I pray for everyone in this room to have ears to hear, eyes to behold your glory, and hearts to desire your truth. Bless this time, we ask, in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Let's uh, welcome Dr. Gould. <clears throat> 
Aristophanes, you know, words, he's basically dressed in a toga, of course, um, traversing, hanging in a basket, traversing the air, whatever that means. And, he's, and he has Socrates asking questions like, how many times the length of its legs does a flea jump? You know, just silly questions. And so even back then, people thought that philosophers were just, you know, asking these silly questions. Um, but of course, it's not just out there in culture. Sometimes even in the church, people don't know what to do with philosophers, right? We're maybe viewed as this kind of annoying gadfly, uh, you know, at, in Sunday school class that asks questions like, what do you mean by free will? Or, you know, or, or if God is all powerful, can he create a stone so, so uh, big that he can't lift it? You know, and you have to think about these things. Um, yeah, but, uh, but and, and then of course there are the jokes. Like I know there's lawyer jokes, but there's also philosophy jokes. So I'm, I'll just share one. I won't share all of the ones that I hear, but... Um, there is a particular joke that's it's not like a laugh out loud joke, but it kind of hits close to home. Uh, maybe you've heard this one. It's, it's the joke, what is the difference between a pepperoni pizza and a philosopher? No one, okay, no one's heard this joke. I hear it. Um, the, the answer is that one feeds a family of four. <laughs> that's, you know, it's more of a groaner, but it, it, yeah, anyway. But the truth is, philosophy is incredibly important to our faith. Uh, you know, as like we like to say in a freshman seminar, you have, you know, philosophy is from these two Greek words, philo or philean, to love, and sophia, wisdom. So philosophy is the love of wisdom. But then as you get to scripture and you read, for example, in like Colossians 2.3, you learn that in Christ are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so there's this very tight connection between our faith and our, our, uh, our thought life. And, and so that's why it really is important. And so as C.S. Lewis once said, you know, uh, in a different context that um, basically all of you are philosophers, right? You already have views about God and the world and yourself. Uh, and you don't have a choice in that. The only choice you have is whether you will be a good philosopher or a bad philosopher, right? A good thinker or a bad thinker, a good theologian or a bad theologian. And I want to help you today to be a good theologian, a good thinker, okay? All right, so why are we sharing this? Well, like... Um, philosophy, Christianity suffers, too, from an image problem. And if you think about it, um, you know, we live here in the, the, the sort of front end of the 21st century, but culture has largely become, and there's a number of different words that people use, sometimes it's po described as post-Christian here in the West, you could describe it as sub-Christian in different pockets here in the West, and you could also describe it as, as sort of hostile or anti-Christian in a lot of ways. And if you add to this the idea that the church has grown largely anti-intellectual and sensate, and basically out of touch with the relevancy of Jesus to all aspects of life, if you kind of add that all up, what happens is that the Christian voice does not get a fair hearing, right? And so the Christian voice becomes muted. Like, nobody wants to hear from us, and they don't care what we have to say. But if you add to that the fact that, you know, weekly we read of, of Christian leaders that disqualify themselves, uh, through usually some sort of a moral failure. Or if we just look at our behavior on social media, uh, you know, and, and the reality is we're often just as fragmented as our non-believing neighbors, right? And so if you add all of that up, what happens is the church is no longer able to fulfill her prophetic role, right? Where historically we are called to proclaim light into the darkness and to be salt into a de decaying world. And so if you add that up, the church is basically, um, the Christian conscience has become muted in culture. And so the values and the emotional response patterns to the world are, are drastically and quickly shifting. But it's not just the Christian voice and the Christian conscience that's muted. I think worse, in many ways, we as Christians look at the world and talk about the world pretty much the same way everyone else does. Right? So we'll use language like mundane. The world is mundane or everyday or ordinary. But in reality, that, that's ex the exact opposite of what the world actually is. The proper words are sacred and holy and gift and deeply mysterious, right? That's what the world actually is. And so as a result, though, we've lost the Christian imagination. And so the Christian imagination has been muted as well. And so really the question I want us to consider today in this first sort of hour is um, how can we work to reestablish the Christian voice, the Christian conscience, and the Christian imagination so that the gospel will actually get a fair hearing, right? That's what we want. And I, I've always been mindful of <clears throat> this, this person here, Leslie Newbegin, um, was a missionary who was in Great Britain. He was sent in like 1936, I think, uh, but he was sent in the 1930s from Great Britain to India to minister the gospel to the Hindus in India. And he did this faithfully for 40 years. 1970s, he comes back home and he realizes that his own sending country in the years that he had been away has become post-Christian. 
And so he begins to, and that this is the language that he uses. And so he begins to wrestle with this question. How do we have a genuine missionary encounter with this culture, this post-Christian culture? And so he actually writes a book called The Foolishness to the Greeks. And in there, he asks this question. And this is, it's on page one of the book. And I think it's a really important question for us to think about today as well. So he asks this question, what would be involved in a genuine missionary encounter between the gospel and the whole way of perceiving and thinking and living that we call modern Western culture? It's a great question. What would be involved in a genuine missionary encounter between the gospel and the whole way of perceiving and thinking and living that we call modern Western culture? Now, this is, um, this is Newbegin understood a couple things, actually. He understood that, that the gospel is never proclaimed in a vacuum, right? That there's this cultural mindset, there's this cultural uh, conscience, there's this cultural imagination that informs whether the gospel will actually get a fair hearing, right? And it informs whether the gospel is viewed as plausible or implausible or desirable or undesirable. And he also realized that this is a crucial question, but it's the penultimate question, right? It's not the ultimate question. The ultimate question that we want every person to ask is, what do you make of Jesus Christ? Right? That's the ultimate question. But this is the penultimate question. How does the gospel get a fair hearing? How do we have a genuine missionary encounter? Okay? So that's what I want to begin with today. Is I want to wrestle with this question. How does the gospel get a fair hearing in this cultural mood and mindset that we find ourselves in today? And so I want to, if this is okay, you know, I'm a philosopher, but I want to do a little Bible study, if, if that's okay. I want to take us to what I think is one of the best examples of, of, in Scripture of someone engaging a culture unlike his own. And I think we can use that to learn uh, some really important things. And so I want to take us to Acts chapter 17 and Paul's encounter um, with the Greeks in Athens. Okay, and so if you have your Bibles, uh, you feel free to turn to them. If you don't, that's okay. I have slides, and I'll read you the relevant things that I want us to see. Uh, but I want to make some observations from Paul's encounter with the Greeks in Athens, and then I want to apply it to our context today. Okay, so as you're turning there, just to give you the context, Paul's on his second missionary journey. Uh, he had been run out of Thessalonica and Berea, and he finds himself in Athens, awaiting his companions, Timothy and Silas. Okay. And so um, there it is. There's Athens. And the first, I want to make six observations. The first observation is that we worship that which is ultimate in our lives. Like, look at verse 16. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. This is Acts chapter 17, verse 16. So here we have Paul venturing over a thousand miles from home, all the way to one of the most important cities in all of Greece, this is the home of all these important philosophers, right? So here's Socrates and uh, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, but not just them. You have Epicurus and Zeno. And then you have all these really important storytellers or playwriters, playwrights as well that come from Athens. You have uh, this guy here is Menander. And then you have Aristophanes who wrote that play, The Clouds. So you have important philosophers. You have important storytellers. But you also have uh, this guy Thucydides who was, many people would call him the father of Western history, right? He wrote the first history book in the West, and you can read it. Um, so, okay, so really important city. Now, that by the time that Paul arrived in Athens, uh, as one commentator puts it, Athens had, uh, was in the late afternoon of her glory, right? Um, it was no longer the political or the commercial center of the ancient world. That had shifted to Corinth, where Paul is headed next in his missionary journey. But it was still a very important intellectual city, uh, and, and intellectual city of the Western world. You have Plato's Academy, the very first university in the West. Uh, and it was also a very important religious center of the ancient world. In fact, one person who was at, in Athens or visited Athens at basically the same time as Paul said this about Athens. Um, he said, it is easier to see a god or a goddess on the main streets than to meet a man. And that's actually correct. Um, by most accounts, there were 30 to 40,000 idols that lined the street corners and the buildings and the marketplace uh, all over the city of Athens. Um, 30 to 40,000 idols and about 10 to 25,000 citizens. So it was easier to find an idol than to actually find a live person. And so it's no wonder that Paul is distressed, right? Everywhere he goes, he's confronted with lifeless idols. And so what Paul does then in verse 17 um, it begins to share the gospel. Now, let me just back up. Even though um, we don't have like stone idols everywhere, the, the reality is it's no different, right, in our own day and age, right? We do worship that which is ultimate, right? It could be nationalism. It could be money. I mean, you, you can pick it, right? It could be things. 
It could be uh, sports, it could be entertainment, it could be food, it can be anything. And in fact, I was, um, while I was in seminary, I went to seminary in Los Angeles and at Talbot School of Theology. And when I was there, uh, actually my best friend uh, who led me to the Lord from Miami University, Mike Erie, was there as well. We were in seminary together. <clears throat> and Mike loved this band called Pearl Jam. So I'm going to date myself here, right? Um, Randy, you with me here? Okay, good. Yeah, so Mike loved Pearl Jam. I'm not a huge concert goer, but he wanted to go. They were coming to LA, and uh, so we went. If you don't know who Pearl Jam is, and I'm, I'm guessing that some in this room might not, think really loud, annoying guitars, and you're good, right? Okay, you got it. So we went to this concert, and it was kind of interesting, though. Um, the minute, so they had the, the opening bands, and everybody's just kind of hanging around, but then the minute that Pearl Jam comes on the stage, it was like the whole auditorium just fills, right? And then, and then they begin to move in unison to the beat of Pearl Jam. And I can remember about two hours into this concert, looking around and realizing that I was basically participating in the secular equivalent of a church worship service, right? We were worshiping at the altar of Pearl Jam. And I can remember Mike and I walking out to our car that night, just very much aware of this human propensity to worship that which is ultimate. And of course, that makes sense, right? If the, if the fundamental distinction in reality is creator and creature, right, all of our lives make sense in relation to God. And so we're either going to worship God or we're going to worship something else as ultimate in our place. And that's why, like, you know, I, I do teach philosophy. I know what atheism is, but I don't think the opposite of theism is actually atheism. I think the opposite of theism is idolatry, right? Because we all worship, right? And that's what confronted Paul here. In Athens is this idea. Okay, so verse 17 then, what does he do? He, he's moved to present the gospel. It says, um, let's see here, let me find it here. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace. And then it says, you know, what is he presenting? Well, if you go to the end of verse 18, he's speaking about Jesus and the resurrection, the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So Paul begins to present the gospel and, of course, in doing that, he is um, introduced to the philosophers of the day, the Stoics and the Epicureans, we can read there in verse 18. But basically, there's two reactions that, that are evoked by Paul's presence and Paul sharing the gospel. You have one group in verse 18 that asks this question, what is this babbler trying to say? Right? And that's interesting. You have this interesting word, babbler, which literally means seed picker. What is this seed picker saying, right? And the idea was that Paul was a kind of dilettante that's like, you know, picked up a little scrap of wisdom here and a scrap of wisdom over here, and he tries to pass it off as profundity. You know, what is this babbler trying to say? So that was one reaction that they had to Paul. The second reaction, also in verse 18, says, um, you know, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. And they actually think that he's advocating two gods, Jesus, this god Jesus, and then this god Anastasis, which is the Greek word here for resurrection. They just didn't understand. He's proclaiming these foreign gods, right? And so they're confused. And they do, uh, you know, they invite then Paul in verse 19 to speak at the Areopagus. And again, this is really interesting too, because the Areopagus um, is this literal place. It's on a hill here in Athens. And it's also the ruling body of the city of Athens. And so the ruling body at the Areopagus is the very same group that about 400 years prior to Paul's visit condemned Socrates uh, to death, right? That he was before a jury there in the Areopagus and condemned him to death for corrupting the youth and um, preaching false gods, I think, is what it was. And so he drank the hemlock and died. Um, so there he is in the Areopagus, and they want to hear more uh, from him. And so this leads us to our next uh, observation. I want us to notice that Paul is a student of the culture that he uh, seeks to reach. Look at, look at verses 22 and 23. Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown I'm going to proclaim to you. Okay, so look at this word in verse 23, looked carefully or looking carefully, meaning looking at something again and again and examining it examining it meticulously. So the idea is that Paul didn't just simply uh, happen across these altars to the unknown God. He actually went looking for them, and he did his homework. And of course, what he discovered is all over this city, there, there, there were these altars to the unknown God. And undoubtedly, he would have learned about this plague that hit Athens about 500 years before he came there, in about 428, 429 BC. There was this plague that basically wiped out a third of the city of Athens. It was a terrible plague. 
And uh, during that time, and you can actually read about this in Thucydides, that first historian. Uh, but during that time, you had uh, people that would just offer sacrifices to idol after idol. Say, maybe this idol will stop the plague. But of course, the plague never stopped. And finally, one of their poets, Epimenides, says, why don't we make an altar to the unknown god, and we'll offer a sacrifice to it. And so they make, an, they make this idol to the unknown god, they offer sacrifice to it, and the plague stops. So now, 500 years later, all over this city, you have altars to this unknown god who stops the plague. Right? Now, what's interesting here is Paul is doing his homework, and this points to the character of the messenger. Right? This is an important observation for us. He's intellectually and morally virtuous. Right? He's rightly provoked at the, at the, um, in the face of idolatry, so he has moral virtue. But then he's compelled by the love of Christ to take the time to actually study the culture that he seeks to reach and to understand their perspective from another angle. So he has this intellectual kind of virtue. And all of this actually raises, I think, a, kind of, a couple uncomfortable questions for us right now, right? If you think about our image problem, Christianity's image problem. And the questions are questions like these. Like, could it be part of the reason why we're so maligned and misunderstood is because we just paradoxically haven't actually taken the time to understand the very culture? we seek to reach. And maybe even more pressing, could it be that we're so maligned and misunderstood because we're simply just not the kind of people right, that God calls us to be? Paul reasoned with them in the marketplace and in the synagogue. Right? He possessed this moral virtue when he was intensely distressed or angry over this idolatry, and it moved him to reason. And there's lots of you know, things that I could get on a soapbox now, but I think um, one of the primary problems for us uh, is just our rank anti-intellectualism in the church. Right? and our laziness. Uh, and all too often, we Christians have become intellectually shallow, theologically illiterate, and so we've lost this voice and basically withdrawn from culture. And so we keep our beliefs as a subjective thing, but we don't defend it in the public sphere, right? because we don't know how to. All right, let's get back to the text, though. Um, okay, so next observation, then, is I want you to notice some things about Paul's speech that I think are really important for how we ought to engage culture. And the first one we've already seen in verse 22 and 23 is note that Paul affirms what he can affirm in Athenian culture. Right? He affirms this, the religious nature of the Athenians, even in their idolatry. He recognizes their attempt to grope after God. And so he's going to identify this common ground, this starting point, and then he's going to use that common ground and that starting point to build a bridge to Jesus and the gospel. And effectively, he's going to say, let me tell you about this God whom you worship is unknown. Who heals the plague? Let me tell you the true nature of this God. Okay, so that's the uh, third observation. Next observation. This is really cool. It's one of my favorite um, favorite ones here. I want you to see how Paul outflanks their thinking. Okay, this is really brilliant here. So watch what Paul does. So he's going to move from the unknown God in verses 22 and 23, and he says this: Let me tell you about this God. Let me proclaim this God to you. And then in verse 24, he says, "The God who made the world and everything in it." is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. So this God whom you worship is unknown, who heals the plague is your creator. And then in verse 25, he says, this God is not just your creator, but he's your sustainer. Verse 25, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So this God whom you worship is unknown, <clears throat> who heals the plague is your creator and your sustainer. But he's not just that, he's also your ordainer. Look at verse 26. From one man, a reference to Adam, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. So this God whom you worship is unknown, who heals the plague, is your creator and your sustainer and your, provi your provider, ordainer. And then he says in verse 27, for that reason, right? I love this in verse 27. Um, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. Okay, so by the time you arrive at verse 27, you have a really clear statement of Paul's theology of what's called general revelation, right? God has revealed himself through that which he has made, and so we ought to seek him. And in fact, you have this, you know, this is why God did this. And you have this really interesting word in verse 27. It's the word reach out. I mean, I have the NIV up here, and it's the, the language of reach out for him. Other translations will talk about groping about. Um, but what's interesting about that word in the Greek is it's the very same word that Homer uses in a favorite uh, story. Has anybody read Homer's Odyssey? The Cyclops? Okay, good. Um, 
Yeah, so um, if you don't, you probably know about the story, but Homer's Odyssey, you have Odysseus and his men that are trying to get back from 10 years of war and uh, to their homes. And as they're on their way home, uh, they have all these like side adventures. And one of them, they find themselves on this island with these one-eyed monsters, these cyclopses. And in the story, um, this particular uh, cyclops captures Odysseus and his men and is basically keeping them as prisoners in his cave and then using them as either food, basically. And Odysseus, who's a wise military strategist, they devise this plan. And their plan was to get the Cyclops drunk, and then in their drunkenness to spear that eye so they could escape. And so if you read the story, that's what happens. The Cyclops gets drunk uh, because they serve him some wine. They, they spear him in the eye. He's blind. And then as uh, Homer writes, at that moment, the Cyclops is groping about. He's reaching about in his blindness, trying to capture Odysseus and his men. And it's the very same word that Paul has here in verse 27. It's as if he's saying, in our sin, we are under obligation to grope about because I am near. Right? That's what Paul's doing. And then we arrive at my favorite verse, which is verse 28. But to understand verse 28, you need to do a little philosophy. I promise I won't freak you out too much today, but you need to do a little philosophy. So let me just tell you this. Um, for the early Greeks, there were three questions that animated the Greek mind. And they might be questions that, you, you know, they might not animate us, right? What is being? That, the way that I would say that, what is fundamental reality? Like, what is the nature of the world? What is life? And then the third question is, what is motion? A better way that we would say that is like, how do we account for change, right? And so these are the questions that animated the Greek mind. And so you have your very first th philosopher, Thales. Um, you know, and his answer was, all is water. What is being? It's water. What is motion? Well, he's, you, know, you can imagine he's looking out at the Mediterranean Sea and, you know, it's motion. It's water. And then what is life? Well, it's things that have water. It's not a bad first answer, if you think about it, right, for the first philosopher. But then as things go, you have the next guy. This is Heraclitus. He famously said, you cannot step in the same river twice. I'll let you think on that for a little bit. Um, yeah, and he, he said, no, 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 it's not water that's fundamental reality. It's change. Fundamental reality is change. And then he answered these three questions in light of that. But then, as you can imagine, the dialectic continues. Um, they have the next guy, Parmenides. No, 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 it's not change. It's unchanged that's fundamental reality. So he posits some like, mysterious, eternal st stuff. You know? And then he would answer his three questions in light of that. And this is kind of the dialectic that goes on all the way through uh, the Greek tradition, through Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, all the way down to Paul. And then we arrive at verse 28. And look at what Paul says. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. In other words, you know those fundamental questions that you've been asking since the beginning of Greek philosophy? It's him. It's this God whom you worship as unknown, who heals the plague, who's your creator and your sustainer and your ordainer. He's the answer that you've been seeking. He's the answer to these fundamental questions. I love this. By the way, Paul is quoting here, and this is important too, he's quoting Epimenides, this Greek poet. Epimenides said this about Zeus. So what's interesting here is Paul is agreeing with this poet, but then reinvesting it with new meaning, right? And even in the next, uh, so he's, he's quoting from their poets effortlessly as he builds his bridge to the gospel. Uh, the next part of verse 28, he says, is even as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Here he's quoting from a, a Stoic philosopher named Aratus. So what is significant about that is it would be like me quoting from Pearl Jam or, I don't, I don't know, like Taylor Swift, whoever's like the, you know, the most recent, and effortlessly like weaving that into the gospel, right? The, the, the things that they say, and that's what he's doing here in building this case. It's pretty cool. Okay? All right, so that's, so that's a, Paul outflanks their, think, their thinking. Next observation. Uh, he confronts the rank idolatry in their midst. Okay, so by the time you arrive at verse 29 here, what, we, what Paul begins to do is break the conversation out of the orbit of what's familiar to the Greek worldview and the Greek mindset, and he begins to move the discussion into a distinctly Judeo-Christian worldview. Okay? So look at what he does in verses 29 to 32. He says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man who has, he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising that man from the dead. Okay, so there's actually a, a couple really interesting things going on here. Now, having affirmed that spiritual hunger behind the abundance of idolatry, now 
Paul is teaching them that, that's inc- that idolatry is inconsistent with belief in a personal God, okay? a personal creator. And he says, looking short of anything other than that God, this personal creator is idolatry and an empty pursuit. And then he actually begins to introduce to them this concept of moral accountability to, to a deity, which is something that the Greek mind at that time was pretty fuzzy with. And so he calls them to repent, to literally change their mind to, and to adopt a new view. And also within this passage, though, he introduces them to the one who stands at the center of history, Jesus, right? Uh, and he claims that he has given proof to, of this to all men by raising that man from the dead. Now, what's interesting about this, and I don't know if Paul knew this about the city, but there's actually a mythic founding story of the Areopagus that all the Athenians would have known at that time. And the mythic founding of the Areopagus goes back to a play, uh, actually a series of plays, that was written in 428, 429 BC, so during the plague, um, by Aeschylus. And it's it's actually called the Oristia Trilogy. And the second of those plays is called the Eumenides. And in that, you have the mythic founding of the Areopagus, right? And this mythic founding was kind of part of the cultural milieu of, of the city of Athens. Everybody kind of had this understanding of when the, when the Areopagus came into being. But anyway, if you go to the, the humanities and you read of this mythic founding, in that story, what you have, this is like, so again, 428, 429 BC, so about 30 years before democracy, right, takes, takes place and takes root in Athens. Um, and what you have, though, is a jury, um, the god Apollo is on trial with these three furies. This is kind of like a, a proto-jury. Right? And what's so interesting, in the story, though, Apollo says this. In the, this is the mythic founding of the Areopagus. He says, once blood is shed, once a man is slain, there shall be no resurrection. You should go and read it in there. And here's Paul, 500 years later. And he's saying, basically, there's this man who has risen from the dead. Right? Um, which is, I don't know if he knew this cultural background, but it's kind of cool if you think about it, right? What's going on here? Okay, so notice what Paul has done. He's identified a starting place, a common ground, and he's effortlessly built this bridge to Jesus and the gospel and confronted them with the ultimate question, what do you make of Jesus Christ, right? That's pretty cool, and that's going to be really helpful. Now, let's just finish out the, uh, our last observation, then I want to pull this up to our modern context. So observation number six from our passage is very simply that Paul's speech had mixed response, right? So 32 to the end. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Okay, so you have three basic responses here, right? Some wanted to hear more, some mocked, and some believed. Now, a question that immediately comes to mind is like, why did Luke, who wrote Acts, why did Luke um, include the mixed response to Paul's speech? Some Bible commentators have gone so far to say that this shows that Paul's speech was a failure, F.F. Bruce being one of them. And so that by the time Paul arrives at Corinth, he has given up on philosophy, right? Philosophy becomes foolishness to the Greeks. I don't think that that's the case. And I don't think that Paul's speech was a failure. So the question is, why did Luke include the fact that Paul's speech had mixed results? Well, I think there's at least two reasons, and these these might be helpful as we kind of wrap up this, looking at this passage. I think the first reason is this. Um, Well, guess what? If Paul had mixed responses, guess what? We will too, right? Some will mock us and, you know, belittle us and sneer. Some will want to hear more and some will believe, right? And that's just helpful to remember. Like, our job is to faithfully present the gospel um, but it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict them, right? As a good crew person, right? What's the definition, Tom, of successful evangelism? You know it. What is it? <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's been drilled into our minds, right? Yes. So that's our job, to be faithful witnesses. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict them of sin. Right? So that's the first thing. It just is a helpful reminder. Secondly, though, why did Luke include this? Well, I think it reminds us that there's actually another question that's even more ultimate. Remember I said the ultimate question that we want every person to ask is, um, what do you make of Jesus Christ? Well, I actually think there's another question, and C.S. Lewis reminds us of this, uh, sort of a deeper question, and that's the question, what does Christ Jesus make of us, right? Not what do you make of Jesus Christ, but what does Christ Jesus make of us? And here I think what we're reminded of is that he makes a great deal of us, right? So much so that he pursues us um, and uh, to the cross so that we would find life and meaning and significance and so on. And so I think this mixed response reminds us that we are aliens, 
and strangers in this world, and we're called by God, who makes great of us, uh, to be faithful witnesses in a world that desperately needs him. Okay? All right. So, big, big, so a couple observations. Big idea is I want you to notice Paul identifying a common ground. I want us to notice the kind of person Paul is too, but identifying a common ground, building a bridge to Jesus and the gospel, and forcing this question, what do you make of Jesus, to be heard so that the gospel gets a fair hearing. Okay? Now, I think that that's, that's actually instructive. I hope that was cool to see. I mean, I just think this is such a rich passage, but I actually think it's super instructive for our contemporary context as well, right? So here's what we can think about in terms of this question, how does the gospel get a fair hearing? Well, like Paul, we want to understand our Athens, right? We want to build bridges from our Athens to Jesus and the gospel, and we want to be able to consider barriers and address those along the way, okay? So I'm going to give you a model here, uh, and then I want to, then I want to, interact with you on it. So here's a model that's inspired, Pauline-inspired model of how we can think about engaging our culture, okay? So like Paul, let's, let me just, and we're going to do this the second hour, but let's just start the process here. How can we begin to understand our Athens? Well, here's a good way to begin. Remember, remember New Begin's question, what is the dominant way of perceiving, thinking, and living that we call modern Western culture? Let's just see if we can give a word for each of those. Okay, so what is the dominant way of our culture's perceiving? I'm going to give you a word. In one word, it's disenchanted. Our dominant way of perceiving is disenchanted. What I mean by that is that we no longer see the world in its proper light. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an epistemological term. We no longer see the world in its proper light. Instead of seeing the world as sacred and beautiful, it's often viewed as mundane and ordinary and familiar. And so culture is literally under a spell, right? Taking for granted life and goodness and beauty and holiness instead of seeing them as gifts from the creator. So we'll talk a lot more about disenchantment here uh, in the next hour, okay? So dominant way of perceiving, in a word, disenchanted. What is our culture's dominant way of thinking? Well, in a word, I'm going to give the word sensate. Sensate. We're fixed on the physical, the sensory, the material, right? As C.S. Lewis uh, said in the screw tape letters. Who's read screw tape letters? Familiar with it? Okay. Yeah, so very first letter, right? You have senior devil to junior devil. Junior devil uh, is learning how to um, corrupt the patient and keep them from God, right? The enemy above, as Lewis colorfully describes it there. But in that first letter, he says this, your business is to fix their minds on the stream of sensual experience, right? And keep them from awakening their rational faculty so that they would pertain to universal matters. So we're fixed on the stream of experience. That's the dominant uh, way of thinking. Okay, what is the dominant way of living? Well, no surprise here. In a word, hedonistic, hedonistic. We move from one bite-sized episode of pleasure to another, right? Never fully satisfied, um, uh, you know, but ultimately enslaved by them, right? This is actually what um, C.S. Lewis, again, we're, we'll talk about Lewis a lot today, actually. Um, but the Turkish delights, right? Remember, what was the Turkish delight? Uh, well, what was that for Edmund? Anybody had one? They're not that good. I don't like them. <laughs> I'd rather have a Twinkie. But, you know, it's these candies that Lewis loved. But what Lewis is doing with those is he, um, what a Turkish delight represents is something that gives you an immediate sensual payoff, but ultimately ends up enslaving you. That's what a Turkish delight is. And we are addicted to Turkish delights. Things that give us an immediate sensual, sens immediate sensual payoff, but ultimately end up enslaving us. And we can list those, right? There's lots of them out there. So I, let me just, for now, this is good enough. This is a good way to start to understand our culture. Um, okay? So from here, though, we want to begin to ask the question, how can we identify a starting place in our Athens such that we can use that as a launching pad to build a bridge to the gospel? And here's something that I, that I found really helpful. Um, this is actually from a philosopher named Peter Kreeft. But he talks about how God has given us three prophets of the human soul. Uh, sorry, it's early. Can't juggle. Can't catch. Um, okay, I'm awake. Um, three prophets of the human soul. And those three prophets are reason, uh, our conscience, and our imagination. Right? These are th three faculties, three parts of what it means to be human. But what's so interesting about each of these is each of these prophets of the human soul is on a quest for the object of its desire. Okay? So let's see if we can wake everybody up here, not just me. What is reason's uh, quest. What is the object of reason's desire? What is the thing that it seeks? Truth. Yeah, okay, good. So reason is on this quest for truth. How about the conscience? What is the thing that the conscience longs for? 
Good, the good. Okay, how about imagination? Beauty. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You know, it's just the fact that God has created us as rational animals, as creatures created to know God and to know the world around us, right? This is how this is what is part of our essence, part of our nature. So Romans one, and now we've got sin in the world, right? Has suppressed. This desire. So we're going to talk about that. So part of our job is to awaken these longings that every human has. Does that make sense? So God has created each of us to know, and we want that, but then we suppress it. But go ahead and follow up. But, but yeah. When I look at Romans 1, yeah. it, it says, for they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but they really thanked him. Right. And so the idea that you kind of know God in some kind of rational fashion, it precluded people who were retarded, for example, from knowing God or having no idea. Yeah. The Bible says everybody who is a maker knows God. Mm -hmm. Expresses the knowledge of God in, un in unrighteousness. So it, it's not like a, a an intellectual problem you can have in regards to knowing God, but according to Romans one, it seems like more of a moral problem. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so when I say that God has given us a mind that longs for truth. I'm thinking all truth, right? So God, truth about God, yes. Truth about the world around us, yes. Truth about ourselves, all of that, right? So you're talking about, like, um, how do we come to know God? And that's a, that's a sub-question within this. And the mind is going to play a role in that, right? It's not going to be the full story. We've got to unpack a, a broader story. But, but of course, our mind is going to be part of what it means to come to know God, right? We want to have reasonable beliefs, right? Yeah. And, you know, the, the recurring theme is that people do to themselves things that are called teaching because they have Christian hearing. Yes. So they really don't want the truth. I think that they do. And I think we can take that to the bank that they do, right? And I think we can, I think that that longing, because I think this is how God made us, right? God made us to know him and to be rightly, so what is truth? It's being rightly related to reality. Yeah. Are we talking about reason as it is meant to be? Yep. The way it was meant to be. Ought to be. The yep. The way it ought to be. Yep. It is broken. Yep. But uh, you are describing what it is designed to be and supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually going to talk about Romans 1 in the next lecture because I think that is part of this story, right? This is part of our descent into disenchantment. But, but the way that God has created us is to know truth. That's very clear. We are, we are people that are created in the image of God, a perfectly rational being, and we have minds, right? So let, let's, let's see if we can carry that into the second a little bit. But um, no, I think that it's part of the created order that God created us with a mind, right? You're reasoning with me right now. That is your mind that's doing that. That's what God does. And what is the goal of that mind? To seek truth. That's what we all want. Um, okay, so let's come back to that. That's a really important question, and I think that um, we do have some more to say about that. Um, but for now, when we're thinking about how did God make us, well, he made us to know the truth, to know the good, and, and to know, know the beautiful. And when you think about, like, theologically, what is the source of goodness, truth, and beauty, the answer is, is in Christ, right, is God. I love how Augustine, um, in the Confessions, he talks about how um, it's in book three of the Confessions. We'll talk a little bit about Augustine today, but he says of God, he says, you are the beauty of all beautiful things. And then he says, you are the good of all good things. And I would simply add, you are the truth in which all true things point, right? Um, and so, so that's the starting point that I'm going to propose here is, is this. So this is, how, this is how I want us to think about it. And hopefully this will even address some of your concerns here. Um, what is the thing that we can use as a starting point to build a bridge to Jesus and the gospel? Well, I propose these three deep longings of the human heart. Of course, they're suppressed, right? Uh, oftentimes, we're not aware of our longings, right? I'm not even always aware of my longings for, you know, whatever. Um, but we can awaken them they're there, right? And so this is the proposal that I want us to give. How do we build a bridge? Well, we identify these starting points that every human created in the image of God has, these deep longings to know the truth, to know the good, to be united with the good, and to 
uh, be nourished on the beautiful. And then we build a bridge using the planks of reason uh, and, and, so, and conscience and imagination. So here's how this goes. Okay, this is the proposal. And again, I, I appreciate your pushback. Let's think about it in the context even of the pushback. Um, okay, so what does it mean to say that we long for truth? Well, as rational animals, as I said earlier, we naturally desire to know the truth about reality. Like, I love how one philosopher, Aristotle, put it in the beginning of the metaphysics. He says, all people, all men desire to know. Now, of course, this is true, but des this desire has been suppressed. This is part of what I think you're getting at. It's been suppressed in our current culture, our sensate culture, right? So part of our job is those seeking a genuine missionary encounter with the modern culture is to reawaken that human soul for truth, right? To reawaken these rational faculties. And one way we do that is to share the deliverances of philosophy, of history, of science, prominent among others, uh, that point to the truth of Christianity and the gospel. And so for, this would be like the well-walked plank of apologetics, like as traditionally understood, right? It would be like, you know, giving evidence for the rationality of belief in God or the historicity of the gospels or, or you know, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus and things like that. Like as we engage with this evidence, it awakens people to want to know truth. And actually that was part of my story. I can remember being shared the gospel as a freshman at Miami. And I, I didn't believe this stuff, but I just remembered if this stuff is true, I've missed the boat. And so it began with this question that was niggling in my mind and my heart that set me on a journey that ultimately, um, you know, helped me to bend my knee to God. Okay, so we had so we had this plank, and it's a well walked plank um, in the, like the history of defending the faith. These other two though are less walked. So we long for good, the good, right? And this is the conscience that has sort of um, awakened that, 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 where that longing resides. So um, in this book, Cultural Apologetics, that I wrote, I, just, I actually uh, break up this longing for goodness into three sub-longings. Um, the longing for wholeness, right? We want to be whole. The longing for justice, we want the world turned right side up. And then um, the longing to live a life that matters, like a, a significance, right? Um, but of course, the tragedy of the fall is the loss of paradise and the loss of this sort of organizing our lives around the goodness. But still, if we pay attention, that longing, I think, does reside deep within the human soul. So for example, like Blaise Pascal, who's a modern enlightenment thinker, uh, a Christian writer, he, he says, he has this wonderful little phrase in, in his little book called The Ponces, where he says, deep within the human soul, there's like a memory of a memory of a trace of a time when, this is how he says it, when man, capital M, was truly happy, capital H. So deep within the human soul, there's this memory of this memory when things were as they ought to have been, right? And that's what we awaken when we awaken this longing for goodness, when we awaken this longing to see things righted. And so we can walk that plank, and we can talk about how to do that. And then the final plank there, which is really underutilized, um, is this human longing for beauty can actually start, serve as a starting point to build a bridge to Jesus and the gospel. This is because we're drawn to beauty, right? I love how... Again, C.S. Lewis, um, he talked about in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, he said um, where he had like three early encounters with beauty as a young child. And, and he said of his first encounter, he said, at that moment, I became a votary of the blue flower. So there's a lot of language in there. Votary just means like a devotee, a follower. And then the blue flower was this um, mythic symbol in German romantic literature. But what it stood for was something that like um, awakens this intense longing but, but you can never quite grasp it, right? So he becomes this devotee of this thing that's, that awakens something in him and sets him on this journey, uh, but, he, but he's seeking you know, the object of this deep longing. So he becomes this devotee of the blue flower, as he says. So he is moved by beauty. And actually, that was part of his story. We'll look in our third session. We'll talk about Lewis, his theology of story, and we'll see that he, um, he has a lot to say about romance and beauty and things like that. Okay, so this is the model, is that we have all these, these resources at our disposal in building bridges from our Athens to Jesus and the gospel, right? So the last piece, and then we can have a little discussion here about it, is that, of course, we want to be able to address barriers along the way. And so some of those barriers have to do with us, right, the church. I call them internal barriers. And so like in this book, Cultural Apologetics, the three that I discuss there are, are anti-intellectualism, uh, our, our own fragmentation, and then our like sort of unbaptized imagination that we need to begin to see the world as sacred. And then, of course, there's external barriers, things out there that, um, 
you know, are out in culture that are barriers to the gospel, right? And so we need to be able to address those as well. And I think that Paul gives us a good example for that. So let me stop there, but just to say the hope for result and sort of why I wanted to set this up and give you this model, this first hour, is um, that we, we do want to seek to reestablish the Christian voice, the Christian conscience, the Christian imagination, so that we can have a genuine missionary encounter. And I think to do that, we need to, un I think we can learn from Paul, right? We can understand our culture. We can, like him, build bridges to Jesus and the gospel, and like him, uh, respond to barriers along the way. Okay, so I think we've just got maybe five minutes, and then we'll break, or just even less than that. Um, but any questions, thoughts, pushback is all good. So go ahead, either one, and you first, then You mean that, yeah, so one of the, um, one of the rampant or one of the modern themes is individual, like hyper-individualism or something like that. Yeah, and the elevation of self. I think Tim Keller calls it the um, autonomous self, you know, that this is the, the way that we view ourselves today. And, um, I mean, I just think we keep pointing to, you know, how's that working for you kind of question. This is, you know, sometimes the best apologetics just ask questions, you know, why do you think that and how's that going? Because the reality is, again, we were created to know truth in community, to know, you know, to be part of what, how God has made us as relational creatures. We're not autonomous, radical individuals. And so we know that it's not going to work, right? This is where we know from scripture that we're created to be in community. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just asking questions like that. I think we see the bankruptcy everywhere. Part of our job, like Paul, is just to point out, I think, and maybe that's part, all we can do sometimes. And then in doing that, maybe that starts them on a journey where they think maybe there's a better way. Yeah. Yeah, that's a yeah, sometimes it's as simple as that. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, totally. And, and yep. so, as we look at our culture, and I can see how each of those pieces are tied in here, it's, you know, how will Jesus Christ be greater yeah. between what you yeah. have and the right. of, of recovering what God's done versus the... Yeah, the, right, and, and even, like, we, like... Culture is so far from where we are, right? It's even further away than like Paul. Right? He had some common cur currency. What's interesting in the book of Acts, um, there's only two times in the book of Acts where Paul engages a culture unlike his own. Um, one is in Acts chapter 17, the other is in Acts chapter 14, when he engages the God fearing Greeks in Lystra and Derby. The other, all the other missionary encounters that you read of are him engaging a culture, the Jewish culture, those who are Jews primarily. And so if you look at Acts 14 and that encounter and Acts 17 and this encounter, though, you, I think we do have some, some help, you know, in even seeing the language that he uses. He's using biblical concepts, but in the language of the Greeks, right? And, and, and that's helpful, right? And, and I think that's part of what it means to love our neighbor is to present the gospel in a way that people can understand. You're right. And so part of our challenge um, today, and it's a big one, this is why I was kind of harping on anti-intellectualism, is that not only do we need to be students of theology, right? We do want to know scripture and we want to know the truths of God, but we also need to be students of culture. And then we got to put them together. And that's a, like, how do we have that, those conversations? And that becomes very hard, right? Because as culture is, you know, moving further away. Um, so it's like a high bar that we're calling ourselves to if we want to have this faithful encounter. So, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, good. Right, and so now it's not just, so at least in Paul's, you know, during Paul's time, everybody at least understood that truth was some kind of correspondence with the way the world is. Today, it's like we have to even define what truth is, right? And is there something such as objective truth? Is it all just subjective, whatever I believe is true, right? So that's like, so we have more work to do even today. Yeah. Yeah, Tom? Yeah, the sovereign I self. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I'm in charge, I get to do these, I get to take the prison, and I think everybody is that. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to try to drill down into culture in the next hour and um, see if we can make some sense of it. But it's, yeah, it's difficult. Um, we'll go back to you, and then in the back, and then we'll, then we'll take our break. So how about that for now? Yeah, yeah. So the observation was that Paul affirmed what he could affirm in the Athenian culture. Right? It doesn't mean he affirmed everything in it. That, that's it. That's the only thing. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I think that that's part of his outflanking their thinking, you know, that he's doing. So he affirms what he can affirm, and I think that's a good thing to remember. Right? There's things we can affirm when we should. Um, but you're right. He doesn't pull punches. That's the outflanking, and he's doing it in ways that I think are brilliant. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'm just in agreement with you, but I don't want to miss the point that he does find common ground as a starting point, right? But that doesn't mean, of course, he's going to agree with everything. So, yeah, I think that's good. Okay, last comment. We'll take a break. Yeah. So I think it's um, it's harder to find common ground now, possibly, because mm -hmm. it's all shifting. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that is a benefit to a lot of the Christianity, but um, the disciples that he ended up on will say that long before lots of lots of more people and lots of more companies went to the faith in the first century world. So like in terms of talking about like a tiny you know um, second world section of you know all of Asia or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really do think that these three longings here are universal longings that every human has. And so I think that um, even those who live according to lies and, and untruth, it's, there's going to be a brokenness. There, there's going to be a, a lack of the good. Their life is not organized around the good. So I think, like, if you think of our desires, like, take the set of all our human longings, right? Think of it, like, as an inverted triangle. Um, at the top, you have your surface desires, right? And this might be some of the worry, confusion, I think, here. You have like your surface desires, and then as you go down to the, the bottom of that, you have your deeper desires, and ultimately the deepest desire. So what is man's deepest desire? The thing that we're created to long for. God. We can take that to the bank. That's part of how God made us. Right above that deepest desire are all these deep desires. And there I would put the longing for truth, goodness, beauty, as well as the longing for um, meaning, purpose, happiness, in the capital H classic sense, the rich sense. All of those are down there, and that's part of human nature. Now, we're, of course, those are muted in our culture, but we can reawaken them. That's the proposal. I don't think that they're there. In the same way that the longing for God isn't gone, it's not like that's not there, right? We have to reawaken that longing. And that's the claim I'm making with these other longings. And so, actually, C.S. Lewis has famously gave this argument from desire, 
right? And, and so he had his, in, his, in Mere Christianity in the chapter on hope, he, he says this wonderful phrase. He says, he says if I find within myself uh, longings that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most likely explanation is that I was made for another world, right? And so in there, he's talking about what I would call the transcendent longing, this deepest longing for God. But in The Weight of Glory, he runs that same argument with the longing for beauty. He goes right, one step up and he looks at this other deep longing of the heart for beauty, right? And so I think that that's the kind of thing that we can do here when we think about these longings is they're there. We know it because God has made us this way. So let's surface those longings and set them on a path that leads ultimately to the source of goodness, truth, and beauty, which is God. Okay, we need to take a break and then we'll keep going. So, good. Hey, yeah. hey, Bob. Hey, yeah. Randy and Holly. Oh, nice. Yeah. Thank you. I was just thinking.